Losing my religion by REM. You're listening to the Russell Brand Show live on Radio 2. And here's your host, I am. We're not live, actually. This is happening in Boulder, Colorado, probably sometime yesterday. I'm here with Matt Morgan. He's in charge of a limited number of switches, but still enough to make him feel important. And let me tell you also that he's wearing a cowboy hat right in his head. How are you, Matthew? I am very well. You look ever so well. Why are you wearing a, <laughs> a hat, cowboy hat and sunglasses over your headphones? indoors yeah, in a radio it's, studio. It's really annoying, isn't it? I can't have it, the headphones on with the hat. No, because what it looks like is that you've got a John Merrick-style head under your cowboy hat and you're concealing a cauliflower's worth of tumours under there. Who has got a John Merrick-style head? Me! Who has been <laughs> measured by cowboys with a <laughs> cowboy hat and a... I've never seen anything like it. Well, God darn it, I've never seen a melon that size in all my years. <laughs> we went to a place called Cowboy Town. What was it called, Matthew? Ellsworth. Ellsworth. Ellsworth, right in the middle of Cowboy Town. Like, while B- Bill Hickok had been there, so had other cowboys. Billy the Kid had been there. They'd had gunfights in the streets. Ellsworth, it called. There were saloons and all sorts of mysterious characters. We will be telling you about those characters. And furthermore, we will be talking to Noel Gallagher on this show a little bit later. We've not spoken to him for a little while, have we, Matt? For ages. It's probably done a baby out of his girlfriend. They should have had a baby. They should have had a baby by now. Has, do you know if he has? No, I don't know nothing about it, but I reckon he's probably one of them two. Him or his girlfriend must have done a baby by now. So we'll talk to him about that. What else have we got coming up on the show? We've got a whole host of what I can only describe as things coming up, right? Here are just some of those things, right? Uh, hold on. Yeah! Right? Hold on, hold on a second. We've got important things. Oh, yeah, that's it. We've got a man who's an artist. He does artists. He does his art on an Etch-a-Sketch. Imagine that. It must be frustrating because you Etch-a-Sketch and it's art and then... He has to die. You've got to shake it away, baby. Well, you, I mean, how expensive are they? Maybe you just keep it on keep the Keep the whole Etch-a-Sketch just hang it up on the wall. What was the dust in there? Did anyone ever find I that? I don't think it was good for you, that Etch-a-Sketch drugs. I mean, dust. <laughs> there you, you go, Steve. You used to smoke foil. <laughs> I used to smoke etch sketch dust or foil, and I grew up to be a very confused and frightened young man. But my drawings are brilliant now, and my pen never leaves the paper. Um, yeah, so we'll be meeting him. Also, we're talking to a bloke who runs a theme park known as Diggerland. Imagine that, Matthew. Diggerland, a theme Diggerland. park. What's the point of that? What is it? Like a JCB thing? He's celebrating diggers. We're going to talk to him and find out what makes him tick. Why are you running Diggerland for? What are you running Diggerland for? What are you punching yourself for? What are you punching yourself <laughs> for? What are you running Diggerland for? Yeah, so, and that's good. So all those bloody things are coming right up. And, uh, yeah, we'll be talking about our experiences over here in the US of States, talking about, um, we're learning about Jack Kerouac. Every day we learn a little bit more about him. I've got an email here from someone calling himself Mike Sweeney. Hello, Russell and Matt. Appreciate the chaotic humour and interesting insight on your Radio 2 show. I understand your current escapades have taken you across the Atlantic in dedication to that brilliant writer Jack Kerouac or as I call him Jack Caddyshack my favourite section of the book is the following passage in 1942 I was the star in one of the filthiest dramas of all time I was a seaman and went to the Imperial Cafe on Squale, on Squale Square Boston to drink I drank 60 glasses of beer and retired to the toilet where I wrapped myself around the toilet bowl and went to sleep during the night at least 100 seamen and assorted civilians came in and cast their sentient debauchments on me till I was unrecognisably caked what difference does it make after all anonymity in the world of men is better than fame in heaven for what's heaven what's earth all in the mind i particularly like the phrase sentient debauchments meaning poo what's your favorite section and why happy es- existentializing mike sweeney we'll tell you about our favorite sections when we bloody well feel like it mike stop pressuring us although i do like the idea of like i used to fall when i was a junkie i used to fall asleep in public toilets quite a lot and pub toilets you know you just doze off in there and to tell you the truth it was all right but you do always go in the ladies I know, that's why it's Which much more... Which I've to drum out of you over here. Because in, in America, as you will notice, there's conformity. People do not like men going in the ladies. But guess what? The last public toilet I used, I went right in the ladies. When why? Because it's nicer. You might the... make women uncomfortable. They like it, Matt. It's spicy things. I suppose things stop when you go to the up... toilet. <laughs> 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 that's what I'll do the rest of the time. Keeps me ticking over. Right, OK, we've got some interesting musical choices coming up that are going to blow your little thockleberries off. Should we, right, we listen to Losing My Religion, which is about to become incredibly pertinent, because a little while ago I'd done a trail for our radio show. Not a trail, a, like an advert for the telly. You promo. Know? Promo, yeah, promo's what it was. Promo. I've done promo. <laughs> right, I've done this promo. Don't believe 
believe the hype? <laughs> What's that bit in, in Don't Believe the Hype? Why does someone go, <laughs> Don't, don't, don't believe the hype? <laughs> well, I don't believe the hype because I'm a horse. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done it with like this promo and it's using uh, Losing My Religion, right? And I have to do this thing where I pick up a mandolin and play a bit of Losing My Religion. Of course, I can't really. Uh... Matt, when you nod, your cowboy hat well, moves no, at a different speed to your head. It's like Laurel and Arden. It's ridiculous. Because, like, yeah. Plus, you look like Jim Morrison half hour before his final bath, scrubbing <laughs> and waiting for death. Well, what do you look like? Should nice. we get into that now? Yeah, baby, bring it on. If you want to describe my appearance, God, go for it. Right, well, let's start from the booties. <laughs> I've got some new rootin' tootin' boots on. What's wrong with my rootin' tootin' boots? Well, when I went Wild West, I got a proper hat, a decent shirt. I look like mm. a cowboy. We've been dressing me and Matt. Me and Matt are dressing up as cowboys now because we're in America. So we've got Russell's all cowboy clothes. Russell's dressed up more like an Avon lady. <laughs> oh, they're nice. They're like little cowboy boots. I love those. <laughs> <laughs> got a skull on. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> oh, a skull, because you have one of those inside your head. Here, you've got a skull inside your head all your life. Isn't it amazing? There's a skeleton inside you. No wonder people are so evil. There's a skeleton <laughs> living inside you. I'm trying to change the subject from your boots. I love my boots, mate. Sandra. Matt thinks I should be called Sandra Proudfoot because I'm walking around all proud of my so boots. I'm so proud of his boots. I love he puts my them boots. up on the dashboard. Oh, I love them. Come on. I can't believe what I was like before I got these boots. God, so, you know, I used to not have these boots. You know, and people before now who met me without the boots, they were meeting a kind of shadow version of me. <laughs> now I'm the ultimate realisation of me. And my rootin' tootin' goddamn booties. Do -do 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 -do. They've got skull and crossbones on them. And what's best of all is the lady in the shop. <laughs> I've got some new boots. You pinched me and then I scratched you back. <laughs> right, the lady in the shop, right, to take the booties off, she puts the boot and you're, with your foot inside it, between her legs, clasps it between her thighs. Then you push her ass with your other foot to get the boot off. It's like a sexual experience. Like you sort of kick a woman away by her bum and a boot pops off like, whoop, I've done a booty. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, but you tried that boot on so many times. Yeah, it I was, was becoming embarrassing. I was like Mr. Ben in that shoe shop. <laughs> Give me another pair of boots, another pair of boots. But every time, no matter what boot I put on, it was always the same land. Land. And here's your host, Russell! And that belt as well. What's wrong with my belt now? Looks like, I don't know, it's sort of Louis XV style. <laughs> <laughs> if Louis the if Louis the Fourteenth had put this belt on, they'd have said, "Sir, you're going to isolate yourself from the peasant population by wearing that." <laughs> People are already getting rowdy. You might want to take that off. Who oh, to hell with it? Let them have jam or cake or something. As long as they're fed, let's not worry about it. Anyway, that's his bird, as far as I understand. Right. So why don't we listen to a little guy called Tom Waits, who was very much inspired by Jacko Kerouacko and the Beatty Poos. And this song I really like, right? Because it's about. Oh, someone's listen to this and think, "Oh, here am I, all lonely." in the world, you know, it's called, called Better Off Without a Wife, and it, it sentimentalises the idea of living Is sort of you like how I do. when you're sat in the ladies' toilet <laughs> with your little booties on. <laughs> Better off without a wife. I don't <laughs> need them. I don't need them. They'd probably just stop me doing what I want to do all the time. You're just sitting in the women's toilets. Yeah, I wouldn't be in here if I was married. Probably my wife wouldn't like it. Probably someone put a restraining order on me or something, wouldn't they? <laughs> Let's listen to Tom Waits, Better Off Without a Wife. What are you doing? Vinyl. We are playing this on vinyl. Well, this gives me an opportunity to say hello to Poet Laureate of the show, Mr. G, in London. Hello, Mr. G. How are you, my friend? Yeah, how are you guys doing? What does your belt look like? Well, it looks a bit like... Imagine Liberace decided to camp it up a bit for a weekend. <laughs> it's the kind of thing he'd wear. It's sort of like made of like silver nickel, sort of like little square plates, like the shape of Bourbon biscuits. Then it's got a proper like silver buckle in it. It's a bit Dolly Parton. It's like a sort of sexy hip garter. You wear it around your head. Oh, look at Matthew Morgan, you baffled. How would we have coped in, if we was on Radio Caroline in the middle of a ship on the bloody ocean? You'd sink the bloody place. Were you in the crow's nest? Yeah. Oh, we wouldn't last ten minutes out in the ocean waves. Right, so we're, this place we're in, this radio station in Boulder, there's all sunflowers just growing wild outside and lilac. It's a really sort of beautiful place. It's run, I tell you something as well, it's a collective paid for by the people, which after the revolution there's going to be a lot more radio stations like this, let me tell you, except instead of a variety of world music, it'll all be stuff like this. I'm me, I've got some cowboy boots, I'm me, I've got a brand new belt, I'm me, look at my hair, I'm me, can I have sex with you please? Right. Matt is going to play some vinyl. You're listening to the Russell Brand Show on Radio 2. This is Tom Waits on vinyl coming at you from Colorado. Right, thank you, Evan. All you have to do is lift the fader. This is There's Tom Waits. Better off without a wife. I think about this in toilets. Oh, my friends are married. Every Tom and Dick and Harry. 
Perhaps don't touch me. Must be strong of you to go it alone. Tom Waits better off without a wife. What you didn't hear is there was moments of absolute chaos going on there as we tried to wrestle with different eras of technology analog. and technological understanding. Analog. Analog's bad. I was always trying to stick up for analog when digital came in, but now analog. How did you do that? I just would pick would go, oh, this is a digital revolution, and I'd go, well, try analog, mate. It's like waves at the seaside. You're not going to get that. And then I would mention the Terminator films and how technology was ultimately our enemy. But nonetheless, that was Tom Waits. Matthew, perhaps you'd like to do for us your impression of Tom Waits singing any song. Oh, I love drink whiskey, <laughs> and I'm from Sesame Street. <laughs> That's about it, isn't it? Well, today we're going to learn about the number two on the letter C. A dooby 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 doo. I've been drinking. But sometimes he doesn't use that voice. He uses a more serious voice. What's his more serious voice? Um, it's just not as Sesame Street. He sort of sings. You think he sounds a bit a like. A little rain. Like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes into a more of a normal singing and then voice. Sometimes he thinks. Hmm, what this song needs that I've just written is that stupid voice I sometimes do. <laughs> when I go like that. Do you know, I think, I think Tom Waits speaks like this. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna surprise you guys. I'm gonna do this song as a big woolly mammoth from Sesame Street. I'm gonna do it a little bit. Okay, dooby dooby, I've been drinking in the Bowery. Zooba dooba doo. And to celebrate that idea, we have got the actual Mr. Snuffleupagus. Well, it can happen, so get ready. I think he's called Marty. Marty, are you there? I'm here. Marty, are you wow. are you actually really Mr. Snuffleupagus? Are you guys actually trying to imitate my favorite artist, Tom Waits? <laughs> yeah, so you are you, inspired, you as a I career. Think I Tom Waits in bars and after hours when I can. Uh, Tom Waits is like a god to me. You guys gotta, you gotta, you gotta be nicer to Tom Waits. We love Tom Waits. We're okay. not attacking Tom Waits. <laughs> We're just saying there's an uncanny similarity between Tom Waits and your character, Mr. Snuffleupagus, Big Bird. Actually, I, I do another character called uh, Telly Monster. I do it a lot more than Snuffy. What? Well, all right, you big ego maniac. What's the other? What's the other one? <laughs> Snuffy. His, his name is uh, Telly Monster. Who's Telly Monster? He sounds a lot more like Tom Waits. Go on, then do Telly Monster. Um, he's, he's down here like this. Uh, if, you, if, if Telly were to sing a Tom Waits song, it'd be, well, she's up against the register, apron and a spatula, with yesterday's deliveries and a tickets for the bachelors, like that. That's indistinguishable that from actual Tom Waits. Tom Waits. That if you that you couldn't if you said here's my Tom Waits impression, it would be that. Now, uh, well, could you do Mr. Snuffleupagus uh, doing a Tom Waits song, please? Oh. Uh, <laughs> he's got to say uh, Big Bird. Snuffy would never sing a Tom Waits song. He's he's much too simple. I'm uh, I'm actually talking now into my coffee cup, which makes it a little bit more <laughs> hollow. But uh, Snuffy's just kind of down here like that. Thinking about it, I remember Snuffleupagus being a bit more like he had yep. a vibe of homelessness about him. That Snuffleupagus sounds really like he works in a library. <laughs> Well, Snuffy actually has evolved, uh, which characters do. Uh, well, you know, he hasn't evolved. He's a woolly mammoth. He's an archaic, atavistic relic from the ancient past. Well, he's a relative. He's some kind of offshoot of the woolly mammoth, but he's the offshoot that actually survived. Well, and, well uh, you know, I mean... And, and, and actually managed to... Uh, Get a, a level of, uh, of intelligence to you know to make it in this. Marty, world. you know how when Robert De Niro would go a bit mental when playing Jake LaMotta and like sort of think that he was Jake LaMotta? Do yeah. you sometimes walk around thinking that you are a, a woolly offshoot of the mammoth? No, <laughs> you do because you were sticking right up for Snuffy then. Um, how I'll, po I'll, I'll, I'll stick up for him, but uh, you know, but when I once once I crawl out, I'm you know I'm I, I don't carry him with me. Crawl out. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm inside of him. You dirty devil. Did this you... is a children's program. Did you well, used to be in the costume? Actually, children have run screaming from the studio when they when they watch me crawl out. It's, it's kind of like the side... Keep that quiet. The... Bloody hell. <laughs> it's what, it's kind of like there? the entrails. Are you inside him? I'm inside him, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that. I thought the voice would be added on after. No, no. That's actually the key to all the Muppet characters is we, you know, we perform them... Ooh, you know, we, we do the voice while we're wiggling them. Okay, okay. Now, listen, this is something Mr. G, the poet laureate of our show, pointed out, that Mr. Snuffleupagus was, in fact, meant to be sort of the imaginary friend of Big Bird, but it caused a lot, caused a lot of controversy and chaos and confusion. Could you talk to us about that in what can only be described as a succinct way and perhaps in a, a stupid mental voice? 
You know, you know what, what mental voice? <laughs> oh, so stupid and daft. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, like, Snuffy. Oh, boy. Even though, you know, Snuff, Snuff has... You know, only knows things that Snuffy knows. I mean, I know a lot more than him. You're obsessed with that elephant. I, I've been doing him for 27 years. He's, he's been very, very good to me. Oh, that's but, nice. But the, the, the deal with... with he used to be thought of as, as Bird's imaginary friend, but he just had bad timing. He was very shy, which was kind of the joke of the show, is that he's, he's 8 foot high, 15 foot long, and nobody's ever seen him. But, it's, but it's, it spoke to the... You know the the adults' you know inability to take the time to uh, you know to you know to go into a kid's uh, imagination. That's a pretty yeah. powerful agenda that was being expressed there, Marty. The, the, the what? It's a powerful agenda. The idea oh, that adults yeah. aren't prepared to inhabit the magical world of the child, but are all too you know it's a bit J D Salinger a bit, <laughs> and it that idea. You okay. want to watch out that no one gets inspired to carry out a bloody murder on Big Bird. <laughs> Can lead to all sorts of bother. Where, where that kind of led us, though, was that uh, that Big Bird was to put in a, kind of an adversarial position with the with the adults. Was that you know the adults are all saying, ah, yeah, sure, your imaginary friend, you know, tell us more, Big Bird. Which Big Bird, as the you know as the child substitute for the show, you know, he's the the, the wonderful child is always asking the question. I remember there was a lot of tension around yeah. that time on Sesame Street. It put a lot of tension on Birdie. If ever, if ever Sesame Street was going to tumble into a riot, it was that period there. <laughs> there was a lot of diver. It was very much the Rodney King flashpoint moment of Sesame Street, if there, I can put it in was, those terms. There was a time to, I mean, to get a little serious when uh, you know things were happening in uh, in daycare centers and kids were kids were going home and telling their parents, "Hey, listen, you know, bad things are happening there," and the parents themselves were saying, "Oh, stop! You're, you know, you don't know what you're talking about." And you know, it turned out that it was true. So we decided that that was. Pretty hmm. bad role modeling for Sesame to do, so they decided that uh, it was okay for parents to to listen to kids. Marty, to until them. this day, Marty, I never considered that woolly mammoths could be a sort of Trojan horse for the revolution. Tucked up inside that mammoth are some pretty powerful ideas. Marty, thank you very much for coming on our show. You've been a wonderful contributor. Could we just hear a bit more of that telly monster singing a bit of Tom Waits, please? Just a, you know, a few bars of well, oh, anything of your choosing. Yeah. Where the the piano has been drinking, not me. Do you see? Not me. It's the same. It's just the same, it's just the same as Tom Waits. <laughs> we could, if Tom Waits ever gets, I don't know, assassinated, we could just have you do it. Would you? But we'd insist on you dressing as a woolly mammoth, though. Might not please all the fans, but it'll certainly spice things up. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you, my dear Marty. What a lovely contribution that was from our Sesame Street. Well, that's nice to talk to someone from Sesame Street. Because who would have thought that, Matt, when we were children watching Sesame Street, that one day we'd get one of them on the phone, catch one of them. Yeah, but th that voice wasn't the voice I remember Snuffleupagus. I don't remember Snuffleupagus. I thought around the wrong way. Yeah, I know. I didn't remember Snuffleupagus talking in that way. And so what, Snuffleupagus was only in Big Bird's imagination? Well, I think the main message is, what I've learned, is don't trust children. If children tell you something, they're probably lying. Dismiss it. Just, just dismiss it out of hand. And how was Big Bird representative of children? He was an was, idiot. There was children round him. Yeah, why are they not representing themselves? Who do you think he is coming in representing when yeah. there's children come represent themselves? And all, whenever I watched it, all I thought was I wanted to touch his beak because it was all perfect and yellow. <gasps> And then all the rest of his body was feathers. Feathers? I wanted to get some of them feathers and pull them out so there was a bear patch around his midriff and he looked like he was wearing a bikini made of feathers <laughs> and make him like a sort of a th bikini bird. <clears throat> That's what I'd like to have done. Right, oh, so coming up now, right, this is uh, while we've been traversing the country, the enormous plains of Kansas, the intimidating space so vast you feel God in your every breath, is we've been listening to some interesting music. This is from Frank Black, formerly of the Pixies, called The Swimmer. It's really mind, they sound mind bendingly simple. And beautiful about it, isn't it? What is it, Matthew? What's in there? I don't know. It's, it's the Catholics as well. What you band. Oh, right, the, the Catholics, they helped. Frank well, Brack God bless them. Frank Brack. Frank Sorry, Brack. too late. So, uh, yeah, listen to it. He's going on about some Forrest Gump swimmer. That's what Matt says. Anyway, here is Frank Black, Catholics. <laughs> Frank Black and the Catholics, the swimmer. You listen to Russell Brand on Radio 2. I'm here with Matt Morgan. How are you, Matt? Very well. Why have you started going to gay line dancing clubs all of a sudden? Because I like it. Right, well... It's a lifestyle choice. What was the turning point? One minute you're not going to gay lap dance... Not gay lap dancing. Oh, God, we've been to a lap dancing club on this little trip. That was a grim little nightmare. No, it was called Shady Ladies. If you're going to have a lap dancing club... 
don't call it shady ladies because you've made explicit the implicit. Call it something like sophisticats, yeah? Sophisticats in London. It's sophisticated. And I imagine that... I've never been, but I imagine the logo is a sort of a sexy cat. Do you reckon... Do you reckon the logo for sophisticats... What's always going on about this? Yeah, but I want to get to the bottom of it. Do you think the logo for sophisticats is a sexy woman cat wearing a basque and lingerie or do you think it's a, a man cat, cat? Yeah, with a, like a top hat on and a cane, sort of winking, wearing a monocle, and then not wearing trousers or pants, but not having genitals. Could be both. Could be a woman up on a stage looking sexy, like it's a very... Jessica Rabbit cat, mm. and then a sort of, uh, you know, top hat wearing cat watching her. It's a very complicated logo, that, because I'd just go with one. I'd say, look, either we're going to have a male posh cat in a top hat, or we're having... But then he's too much like, top cat, the irreplaceable top cat. Is intellectual. <laughs> he he, he bossed them others around too much. I'd have left. Yeah. If I was living he in lived that in bin. A dustbin, didn't he? Of course he did. So There's did a... that bloke on Sesame Street. Yeah, Grouch Show, the Oscar or something. Oscar the Grouch. <laughs> Try not to worry about the details, Matt. All I know is he was living in a bin. Uh, what the hell are we on about? Oh, yeah, the logo for Sophisticats. So. Go with the female cat. Because yeah. then you know what you're getting. Yeah. If there's a man in a top hat, you might accidentally go in there and there's just men in top hats walking around. Yeah, well, that'd probably dancing. be more to your liking if they were wearing cowboy hats. Where was it? We were in Denver, so you suddenly go to a gay lap dan line dancing club. Oh. What, what goes on? Well, it's uh, it's bizarre, actually. There's mm -hmm. like, all cowboy people in there. And they're yeah. all doing special dances that they've probably learnt from, like, Childhood. years ago. Yeah, they all knew how to do the dance. They all knew? Yeah. Could you not have joined in because you'd have been embarrassed and looking at your feet shuffling about? No, you would the like, things they were doing you just couldn't pull off. Couldn't I have gone with my boots, do you think? Wouldn't they have accepted me as one of them and I perhaps made me their king? Possibly, yeah. I think they'd have liked you. Man. In my Sandra proud for Avon lady outfit, I'd have been the belle of the ball, wouldn't I? No, they were quite butch, there's some you know. What, big butch gay fellas? Yeah. Did you see any action? No. What Nothing. Mean action? Well, you know, fellas at it. No. Kissing each other, getting off of each other. It's quite a chilled out vibe. <laughs> what kind of gay club's nice. that? I mean, I don't wish to stereotype, but I'd prefer it if there was lots of filth going on in there. I just like it when I'm not being hassled by women or Oh, it must be hell for you. <laughs> Whoa, they're spraying you with their mace, they're kicking you in the nuts, <laughs> they're putting on restraining orders, they're just trying to protect themselves from an inadvertent sexual predator. Um, okay, where, where was the, what have I been doing? Oh, yeah, uh, I didn't go there on my own, by the way. I went there with a few people from the team. You say that, Matthew, but the simple truth is you are a lone hoverer in, <laughs> <laughs> in line dancing clubs in Denver, sipping sour whiskey, weeping and doing Mr. Snuffle Africa's voices, which aren't even accurate, to siren in men onto the rocks of your genitalia. How many hopes and dreams have been dashed there, one wonders. Yeah, shady ladies, for me, I don't like the UV lights. I don't like... The, the, one of them listened to that Smashing Pumpkins record that's about a lap dancing club. One danced to Pantera, like heavy metal. It was quite good. Yeah, but she had Spider-Man tattooed on the small of her back. I mean, if you're, like, about to do a sex act and you're at the back of someone, and I'm not suggesting that it's anything anti-biblical, the last thing I want is Spider-Man's boat race staring up at me, judging me. My spider senses are tingling. Cause it just hey there. Off. Yeah, it's a bit strange, isn't it? Spider-Man, why Peter are you? Parker. <laughs> yeah, hey, what's under that mask? Oh, your spinal column. It's just like, oh. What about that bloke at the door? Because when we went in, there was a cop with a gun. There was a cop outside. with a gun smoking a fag outside. A pretty loathsome sight. And then that huge Jabba the Hutt man at the bar. Jabba yeah. the Hutt was running that bar. It was like he'd been. It, it was like he was made out of butterscotch whip, and he'd been tipped onto a bar stool, and someone had just stuck a fag in his face, like he were a snowman made out of dog muck. Just sat there and sort of got, like when we came, he goes. Can I, I need to see your ID. No, he didn't talk like that. How did he talk more? I'm going to need to see your ID, boys. I, I'm going to need to see your ID, but I don't carry no ID around. You've got to walk around with your passport, are no, you? You think you're the queen. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm very famous in England. I don't need a picture. I don't know if you've seen Big Brother's Big Mouth, but if you had, you'd realise how ridiculous your quest for ID truly is. Where'd you get those boots, boy? <laughs> you ain't from round here, are you? Well, you know, in a way I am. Right, so Matt and me done this little sneaky trick, because I was going, oh, I've not... Oh, I did the sneaky trick. Oh, used to think right. I, oh, um, right. Uh, photo ID. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, well, go for me handbag. Oh, well, let's have a look. I've got some Avon samples if you want them. <laughs> Get them free. Have some of this bubble bath. You'll smell of lilac. It's delicious. You can wash your wash your big stinking jab of the hut calves in this lilac bubble bath. And then so Matt goes, Russell, just give him that ID because me and Matt in a photograph. Although Matt does look like a member of the Manson family in oh, his my photo God, ID. Russell, it's bad. 
awful character. I think if David Koresh had seen that photograph and said, hey, this guy's got a real good skills with guns, do you want him in the cult? we go, bloody hell, no. Look at him, he looks menacing. So, like, me and Matt sort of smuggled his card over to me, his ID card, and I was really sort of daft and loud about it. What's that you say? The ID card, Matt? You know, but that was like, it's Oscar odd. Let's go, Russell, just take this just out of my hand the and show it to him. Talking out the corner of his mouth, me. like a spy, like it's a Graham Greene novel. Just take the pass out my hand, Russell. Just take it. And I was going, what? Do you see I can't pass? take that. This man wants ID. <laughs> you silly sod. This is no time for swapsies. I've got to get us into this lap dancing yeah, joint. Yeah, try this moisturiser. <laughs> <laughs> just dab a little on the wrist. It'll last you all day. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Not too much. Just spray the mist in the air, then walk into it. A piss size amount. <laughs> pea sized amount. I, do you know what? I've been using a pea sized amount of toothpaste for ages, and I read that's for children. I've been using pea sized it's amounts. Human adults are meant to have pea sized. No, mate. What You're I don't like about that acorn. is it's a food stuff. They should say tablet size, so it's more, you know, <laughs> sanitary. No. Pea size, that's horrible. Well, at least they say, have a genital wart sized bit of toothpaste, well, wait, spread it on there. But it's horrible, pea size. If you said sweet corn size, you wouldn't like it, would you? No, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, there's no, yeah, I wouldn't like any of that. Hey, it's odd that I couldn't catch on to that ID thing, because I used to have to do that with travel cards all the time as a young man. You get on the bus, you, like, you can use two travel cards for one person. Show travel card, drop travel card on floor, next person picks up travel card. Shows it. No, you show it and you pass it behind you. Dropping it on the floor is crazy. Dropping it on the floor is good. Then the other person just pretends to be doing up their shoelace, or in my case, so, like polishing their beautiful skull booties. Well, you and then the bus driver's none the wiser. Streetwise skills in that situation were pretty terrible. <laughs> but then we all got in. We all got in, and because what a didn't, night it he didn't was. ID me. Yeah, he didn't, did he? He's, he's obviously thought, thought this person's a regular in here, there's no point troubling him. He's a local, look at his cowboy shirt. Look at him, he fits right in, he's not working for the Avon Corporation. OK, why don't we listen to The Cure, cheer ourselves right up nice, then me and Matt will tell you a story about uh, how we met a sheriff in a, in a gas station. Oh yeah, we're living in America, baby. Hold on, what's that thing? We've got a phone call from someone. Who are we going to be talking to on the phone? Well, the man who runs Diggerland. He's the man who runs Diggerland. He's also got yeah. Noel Gallagher coming He up. can wait. You know, he's probably just wiping up afterbirth with a Kleenex from somewhere. So I'll tell you what, we'll get up. Let's get Diggerland fella up, then we'll get up Gallagher. Right. OK, here we go then. Boys, don't cry. Boys, don't cry. The Cure. You're listening to Russell Brand on Radio 2. We are broadcasting from Boulder, Colorado. What an extraordinary place it is. We've got Evan here. He's producing us. Because what this is, is like a public service broadcasting place, which means that Evan's mostly getting by as far as I can work out on Benzedrine. He's talking... Like, he knows we're on the radio. He's talking at such an... unprofessional. Unbelievable. And now he's squatting like a little champ chimpanzee on the telephone, tickling his own balls to get himself through the broadcast. Evan, you're right, dear. What happened there? Oh, a lousy connection. Oh, there was a lousy connection. Lousy connection well, one. Alexander Graham Bell was very proud of his little invention, and it's very easy to point fingers in life. Hmm. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Dearest Russell, Matt and Mr G, whilst researching communism, says Kat from Lancaster, for a philosophy project, I found something quite interesting. The Smurfs and their ideals have been paralleled with those of communism. The article was quite long and I lost interest after a while. Well, why have you sent it to us then, Kat, you sex addict? But... The main gist of it was that Papa Smurf was linked to Karl Marx because he has a beard. Brainy Smurf to Trotsky because he's got glasses. It also <laughs> took... That's not good, good enough, is it, for communism? The main thing about communism was Karl Marx had a beard, whereas Trotsky had glasses. What about the so socialism was quite important no, to it, it the socialist. revolution? It was a socialist community, the Smurf village. Why don't they have one woman for? That's not fair, that's going to cause tint. <laughs> <laughs> that's the spirit, Matt. Glad to have you back. Uh, because of his little round glasses. It also talks about the lovely little uniform they wear and how that can be li likened to the Mao suit. Outrageous, I reckon. What do you think? Hmm, I don't think that the Smurfs are communists. Who's Gargamel there in America? But they made them blue to hide, hide the that. red. Because They're they were, red. I bet they were red originally. There's reds under the bed. No, we spoke. We spoke to the Smurf Jesus, the son of Smurf creator, and he, he said that, the, that his dad only had a blue pencil, which sounded like an apocryphal lie to me. Absolute rhubarb from start to bally old finish, if you ask me. Well, that was good. That sounded like Margaret Thatcher. Did you hear my voice then? Oh, a Margaret Thatcher. That's not a good impression. So what? Who cares? Ooh, I never. Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Prince Charles. Who's <laughs> Lady Diana? Oh, you silly ass! 
Ah, <laughs> oh, we've got some impressions going on. We're impressionists, baby. I'll tell you what we've done, and that's went to the Indianapolis Colts. That is an American football team. They won the Super Bowl, and we met all sorts of people what ran the place. They let me and Matt into their training facility. It's like being able to go into, not Manchester United, because I suppose it's not got the same history, but they are the current holders of the Super Bowl, so that's important. You we touched got... the trophy. I touched that trophy. That's like touching the Premiership trophy or something, I suppose. We tried to nick it for a little bit. They took us right into the catacombs of their organisation. All the walls adorned with ornamental helmets. Everywhere you looked were American cultural historical artefacts, newspapers of times that the Indianapolis Colts had triumphed in other events. Then we went to the office of Coach Dundee. The what? The office. Uh, a pub <laughs> It's a bit like an orifice, but it's got a desk in it. And uh, uh, like that, t what's his name? The coach, Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy. We met him. He's really important. That's like meeting Jose Mourinho, maybe. And he was like a sort of a nice, meek sort of a gentleman. He's lovely. And then he left me and Matt in his office, and we rewarded his trust and warmth by silly old thing around in his office, right? I've got his desk and goes, uh, I goes, it's Coach Dungy here. Bye, bye, sell, sell. Yeah, he just left us in his office and we like properly gooned around. It was like, I suppose, once, eh, Matthew, when I was a lad, like they, for some reason, they would make you clean the staff room at our school. What? Like, they would make you clean the You're staff room. You're not ever going to look in there. Well, I got in there, mate, to clean it. Me and Martin Phillips, right, went into the staff room to clean it. And they had, cliche of cliches, a bottle of teacher's whiskey in some little cabinet in there, no. right? Yes, they did. Teacher's whiskey as well. It was kind of like, hey, we're teachers, we'll drink teacher's whiskey. Me and Martin, me and Martin Phillips drank a little bit of that whiskey when we was about seven years old. It was nice to be in there. Well, hang on, at primary school, primary they made school. you clean the staff room? Yeah. And they were drinking booze in there? Yeah. Little Farrock Primary School. I don't think that was It's what was true. Happening. They had booze in there. Booze in there for drinking between... <laughs> that is what was happening. Did you ever get into a staff room? No, I used to think they were sort of magical places. Sometimes you'd look round the door, because you'd have to report to a teacher. Mm. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, I'm in a lot of trouble. Can I speak to Mr... Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Poor bit of and, and also, the staff room was... A lot of the time, teachers said, I hear your name all the time in the staff room. I stick up for you I in that he's staff a good room. Kid. He's a good lad. Don't uh, yeah. make me look an idiot. <laughs> You're making me look a fool. I can't help you if you don't help me. So it made me think that staff room, they'd like read out a name and they'd all go, Oh no. Oh no. Bad <laughs> egg. <laughs> yeah. Take the money. Gamble. Gamble. Yeah. And so being in that Tony Dungy's office, it was a little bit like being in a school staff room. And like, there was, it was naughty in there. I was like, Matt goes, Look, there's his phone there. So I picked up his phone and they had like offense coach, defense coach, all different coaches. Imagine that offense coach, defense coach. There's all sorts of different coaches oh, yeah. goes in and run the American football team. You don't know what goes into it. There's a lot of trouble involved, you know. I rang, I picked up the phone and goes, Hey, it's Tony Dungy here. We're gonna totally change our strategy. We want all the guys to wear suspenders and bras. And people, oh, okay, coach. You know, they they suspected something was amiss, didn't they? Because Tony Dungy was a sort of a gentle well, sort we'll of fella. Well, we'll soon know, won't we, if we uh, see on the news. What's that? It's been a, well, what was it? They all had to wear bras or yeah. something? Yeah, Indianapolis Colts all now dress transgenderly. It's caused a lot of problems out there. And also, it was about, think of some of the places we've been, Matthew. We've encountered some odd things. Indianapolis, strange, eerie town. A bar decorated on the wall by the bullet marks of John Dillinger, the yeah, gangster. Yeah, and when we went to that bar, another toilet problem with you. What's the toilet problem? I went, oh, I need to go for a wee. We're in a sort of pretty rednecky bar. <laughs> With this man, lonely sort of man playing the blues on the stage. Yeah, just one couple watching him. And some sort of, like, big guys watching sport. And I said, oh, I'm going to go for a wee. I'll come with you. <laughs> no, don't. We'll look weird. <clears throat> don't go to the toilet with me. Come on, let's do it together. It doesn't matter. Who cares? I just thought, so what? Them rednecks judge us. Let them. Let them judge us. They'll beat us up. <laughs> Let them beat us up with their judges. So then I gavels. had to wait there yeah. while he went and then tittered back. <laughs> oh, it's big in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went in the girls' one there as well. Did you? See, that's so dangerous, because those people... Oh. How would you explain it? I just say, I've got a special place. <laughs> I'm not a normal boy. <laughs> I've got both sets down here. I've got one for boys, one for girls. I amuse myself all evening. I just tuck it between my legs. I have my own little disco. It's a wonderful time. A wonderful way to pass time. Oh, yeah, they'd love that. They'd let you go. Of course they would. That's the sort of thing that would cheer them right up. Hey, what should we listen to? Well, um, we need to listen to a record, but we've not queued anything up in our imagination. Let's have we? listen to this one. Let's listen to this one! <laughs> 
<laughs> That's Daniel Johnston living life. You're listening to Russell Brand on Radio 2. We are coming right at you from Boulder, Colorado. Listen to this, Matthew. This is from John from Mill Valley. Thought you might like to know, Russ, Matt G, etc. A, you have fans in San Francisco. B, I actually live on a street where Jack Kerouac lived and wrote and experienced some of his book, Dharma Bums, the one after On the Road. Marianne is the name of the house, and they had a three-day party there and loads of sex. Come visit. C, you shouldn't use the word void in poetry. Right, now, you can use the, any words in poetry. They could, gee, there's no rules in poetry, is there? There's no rules other than the rules you place in your mind. Right. Thank you very much. Very liberating philosophy. Oh, and let me know if you want to visit the house. There's a cool old fella who lives there, and he's the caretaker of the place. He's called Maverick. Who wants a caretaker that's called Maverick? Just get on with your bloody job. You don't that's want... not good, is it? Things won't be swept properly. <laughs> uh, Maverick, there's all over the floor. Hey, that's the way I work, baby, don't if you don't like it. <laughs> that's the way I roll. Uh, Maverick, why on earth is there blood all up the walls in here? Hey, what's new? I'm just trying to roll. Dirty devil is making life impossible. So, uh, all right, well, we'll go to that place anyway, because I like the idea of going to an house that is so poorly tended by a man who's proud of his Maverick values. What I like about America, Matthew, probably more than anything else, is, like, sometimes when, like, clichés come rattling towards you 100 miles an hour, well, we stopped at a gas station the other day, right? Matthew knows this already, so I'm telling you, listeners, gee, people of the world, right? We stopped at this gas station, and it can only be called a gas station, and in there, right, well... I don't want to be mean, but there was a snaggletooth hag behind the counter. Hag's oh, harsh. All right. That's a bit harsh. Trailer trash. <laughs> Trailer trash, yes. Poor white trash. That's what we'll call her. A snaggletooth bit of poor white trash behind the counter. Peg tooth. Peg tooth more than snaggled. It wasn't like they were snaggling things up. It was just like they were pegs. It was like each tooth was independent of the other teeth. It's as if there'd been a huge squabble between the teeth at some point, and they thought, this all just, <laughs> we're not going to get on. Let's just live separately so there's enough room to get a cigarette butt between each of us. <laughs> that way we can have some kind of peace. She was in there behind the counter. There was a sheriff wandered in wearing full sheriff uniforms, uniformer. He had a gun, he had a taser, and he had three of his kids with him, proper ill billy kids they was as well. Like one of them, the eldest one, all buck toothed, teeth all pinched together towards the front. Is it like a, like, a weasel? Like a weasel or Nosferatu. Like as if someone, like as if his teeth was a normal arch and then someone gone whoop, and pinched it shut oh, with a bulldog. Sort of gentle Nazi <laughs> travelling the country. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. I'm not sure. Your teeth are disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid you will not be leaving the coach. Yeah, so like, there was like that kid there in with his uh, like with his pyramid face, and then there was uh, another little kid. What? I don't, you I'm judging not... everyone? You totted in. <laughs> Look at you, <laughs> Edward never... Scissorhands, with half <laughs> little glittery belt on. <laughs> These people are crazy. I don't know what you lot think you're dressed as, but you <laughs> look preposterous. Absolutely. That's what she first said to you, isn't it? You got long legs, boy. She did say that I got long legs. You got some long legs there. Do they go all the way up? Well, they go they all do. the way from my cowboy wellies <laughs> up to my glittery belt. <laughs> There's nothing but leg between the two of them. Let me tell you that. It's an in up interrupted leggy poos. And there's yeah, that sheriff in there with his three kids, poor little sods, feeding them blue drinks. Wasn't he? Yeah. Blue drinks they was eating, great big barrels of the and stuff. Then he got his taser out. Yeah, right. I goes, oh, what's some of that stuff? Showed an interest in him. But what I was liked about it before that was there was a bit where that woman goes, I gotta get out of this town. And he goes, hey, this is a pretty good town, Missy. I like it. Goes, well, it was not a good town now. You've shown up. Hey, I'm the best thing that's ever happened to this town. That actually happened. They do it for the tourists. They do that for the tourists. When we went, they went, oh, God, I can't cope with this slit cigarettes. Didn't this they just looked even, out the window? This isn't even real petrol we're selling. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Look at it. This is this is Mountain Dew. Drink it. It's revolting. <laughs> yeah, and then like if I, I can't remember what provoked him to get out his taser. It might have been me, but like he was demonstrating well, he handcuffed it. you at one point. He did handcuff me because he handcuffed the like during that ex cliched exchange that I, I just recounted. He handcuffed on one wrist that lady, the uh, peg tooth, a part eyed toothed woman. He cuffed her right up, and like she goes, oh, I've never been placed in cuffs before. She sexualised it. She really sort of enjoyed it. And then, right, and then he started demonstrating his taser, right, and he goes... Uh, pointing at the floor. Pointing at the floor, but his children were scuttling around really near it. 
And he's like, you know, know, firing a taser. He's like a sheriff. He had a, like one of them badges on. He was tubby. He had a sort of moustache. And then there's a bit where she goes, what you gonna do tonight? And he goes, I'm just gonna watch some TV and have some dinner. She goes, what you having? He goes, I'm gonna try one of those new Inside Out burgers. <laughs> I sort of, what's an Inside Out burger? Sounds like a description of old apartheid for Nethers, I shouldn't wonder. Oh, oh come gone too on! Far. That's not too far. It isn't far enough! Yeah, and then he's firing his taser at the floor. And I was sort of was tempted to let him taser me one for a bit, but then he... I asked him to. <laughs> it's not allowed. <laughs> he, he said he'd demonstrate that taser to show the people of the town it was nothing to be afraid of. Like, on as himself, if it was electricity. Mean. Yeah, like, they tried it out on him. Like, someone fired it at him, and he said that he went onto the ground, and he juddered about a bit, and he said, it really hurts. It's 50,000 volts being fired at you, and it disorientates you, and you lay on the floor, quivering and twitching and stuff. I don't think he should... A, be allowed to have one, mm. and B, take his children with him when he's sheriffing. Yeah, what if there'd been a robbery in that petrol station then? What would he have done? What are those children going to do? They're going to be like little mini Keystone cops throwing their blue drinks at any potential assailants. It's like, weird, isn't it? It was an odd situation, certainly. But uh, it was nice, wasn't it? We were strangely yeah. at home there. Yeah, we're not being prejudicial about them people, are we? Calling them trailer, tr trailer trash and everything? A little. Yeah, we are, because that's racist in a sort of a way. Is it? Mm, nah. It's all right, though, really, isn't it? It's no problem, really. We don't mean it. They, so they, tell you what, though, they are what? friendly, friendly people. They're really friendly. You could fit Very right nice. in. It'd be good to marry one of them. Like, not the sheriff, because, like, you know, every time well, you get bored. Well, I don't know. Yeah, what? You get taser Think access. Of the perks. The perks with the taser, the badges, yeah. No, there would be certain advantages, there's no doubt about that. Now, you might be sat at home thinking, what's going on in the world? I'm confused, I'm disorientated. Well, why don't you listen now and find out what's happening on our dirty little circle on a little show we like to call The News. 88 to 91 FM, this is Radio 2. <laughs> Don't believe the hype. <laughs> don't believe the ghost. <laughs> Why is that don't believe the hype being told to a ghost? Don't, don't, don't believe the hype. <laughs> don't believe C3PO's gay ghost. <laughs> oh, Master Luke, don't believe the hype. Why is he all so It's like when you go to the toilet and you have that shiver. <laughs> I love that feeling. I love that feeling. I'd do anything for that feeling. Anything. Go to the toilet then. Oh, yeah, all right. We'll be back after a short two-minute wee-wee break. I've got to make some winky water. <laughs> oh. oh, it sounds a bit like a horse going... <laughs> like a gay horse, like Mr. Ed's sort of camp cousin. Don't believe the hype. <laughs> I won't believe it. Mind your own business. Saddle up. <laughs> Saddle up and ride the pony. Saddle up and ride the pony. <laughs> we have had a hell of a time. I'm Russell Brand. Before the uh, Don't Believe the Hype, <laughs> you heard a bit of newsy poo. I'm here with Matt Morgan in Colorado. Boulder's the place that we're in. Matt Morgan is now dressed in full cowboy regalia. He's got a cowboy hat on. He's got sort of Ray-Ban sunglasses on. Other sunglasses are available. And a cowboy... Breathe, man. You don't need oxygen. It's overrated. It's for the week. And he's wearing a cowboy shirt as well. So, all in all, Matthew, you look like a penny for the guy made by Motorhead. That's what you look like. No. You look like Motorhead made a penny for the guy. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I like Lemmy's clothing. So what? I like that great big mole on his face. I'd like to draw a face on that mole on his top. face. He's <laughs> got two jelly tots. Talk to the jelly tot, cos the face ain't listening, baby. <laughs> Peach. He's the face of jelly tots. <laughs> jelly tots. Right, OK. Penny for the guy. Penny for the guy. Me and Matt had to go to a gym in New York. What was unusual about that experience, Matt Morgan? Well, I went there as myself. Russell went there. As myself. <laughs> because, right, I don't take gym clothes when I'm going around the world. Yes, you do, normally. Yeah, but I packed light because we had a deal to pack light and then you packed, like, Lady Diana. Yeah, yeah. because I didn't believe that you were going to pack light. I bought about three T-shirts. I wear the same clothes all the time. I've just got three or four black T-shirts, black jeans. I look bloody marvellous. You, you skittering little nerd, dressing up I in bought different options. outfits. You're like the Prince Regent. You're all doled up in all sorts of little cosies. And today, look what you've ended up. No, this looks good. You're jealous. Because I can rock a cowboy look that looks like a cowboy. You look when like... When you dress up, look at you. You, you look, look like... about as you... butch as the cowboy out of Toy Story. You... Woody. You look like Texas Pete out of Super Ted's run Good. through a jumble sale drunk. Good. Yeah, I'm Texas Pete. Oh, Tex, Tex, don't dress like that. You look like a poor cowboy. Yeah, that's true, Tex. You do look a bit impoverished, You look mate. like Bra Brokeback Mountain. 
come alive. I love those guys in Brokeback Mountain. My favourite bit's when they give each other a dicky back ride in the wigwam. <laughs> 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 that bit really lifted my spirit. I've so never seen very it. very high. Well, that's because you're afraid of your own sexuality, except when you dress up like a jumble so store cowboy. Right, here we go. Let me have a little read. Like, this is what I like about the Colorado Daily. If you ever get an opportunity to read the Colorado, Colorado Daily, Colorado Daily, right? It's right at the side of it, they do sort of headlines of stories, and they're like really sarcastic headlines. Yeah, I, know. I thought they were jokes. But they're not. Look at this. On this, this. On the bright side, we already have a coffin, is the headline, the story. To celebrate his 80th birthday, a man in Dorset, England, organised a fake wake, inviting his friends to come and eulogise him, but the party had to be cancelled when he died. It's terribly sad, isn't it? You can't have a joke headline for that. No, it's like someone's death. There's no joke there. I'm pretty sure that's him. Identifying a man who tried to sell him marijuana in Portsmouth, NH, a teenager described him as having a heavily tattooed face with a row of arrows over each eyebrow and tattoos on his forehead, scalp and both cheeks. The police had no trouble spotting him. Hang on, a row of arrows on his eyebrows? Yeah. Over, the, over his eyebrows. On earth... I suppose pointing towards his seventh chakra. I'm with that guy. Hello, I'm an eyebrow, I'm an eyebrow, but we all come together as a team in the middle of the forehead, where we reign so different after all. Listen to this. Headline, but I wasn't actually driving. Two men, one of them with no legs, were arrested for drunk driving in Abbotsworth, Wisconsin, after the cops who pulled over their pickup truck discovered that the legless man had been sitting on the other man's lap and steering the vehicle while the other man operated the gas pedal and brake. Oh. Lovely. Cooperation. That is the very essence of Sesame if Street. If they put a long coat on, they would have got away with that. All they needed was a lovely long coat, pass them off as one <laughs> tall gentleman. <laughs> hey, we can go to the cinema for the price of one! But imagine they got pulled out of the car and that drunk test where you have to walk in a straight line. Right. What, the one that's got no legs? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Try to walk along the line. <laughs> no, because the one with legs is holding the other. Hang on a minute. Right, the one with legs, mm -hmm. right, he's operating the pedals, so yeah. he knows how to drive. Yep. The one without legs is steering, is that right? Yeah, why, why is the one without legs even involved in this transaction? He should just sit in the back and look after the snacks. Unless that other bloke didn't have arms. Yeah, he why did have he involved? arms. Maybe yeah. he's just letting him have a go. I reckon he's just their lovers. And I reckon the whole reason he was sat in his lap <laughs> <laughs> giving him a little bit of winky water. Keep oh, the chair. <laughs> so what? So what if it said winky water? We have invented that, so how can it be a swear word? It can't be. Lack of money is no obstacle. Lack of an idea is an obstacle. That's thought of the day, yeah? Thought of the was day. It? Lack of money is not an obstacle. Lack of an idea. There's an obstacle, baby, and let me tell you, we ain't lacking in ideas because we have got a man called Mick from Diggerland on the phone. Mick, are you there? I'm here, Russell. Mick, you're from England, uh, me uh, old pal, uh, me old butte, me old China. God bless you. Hey, it's, two in, it's two o'clock in the morning here. Thanks for staying up, you big sexy son of Albion, you <laughs> gorgeous part of the legacy of William the Conqueror, yeah? How are you? Uh, all right, mate. All right, and you? Yeah, me and Matt are doing okay. You know, there's a little bit of tension because Matt is a pretty rubbish driver, let me tell you. <laughs> I've been listening, You're joking. I've been listening to you for the last two hours. Have you? Yeah. Well, you make good. it sound like a problem. No, it's... it sounds great. It sounds good. Why don't you, like, well, listen, let's talk about, we'll talk about Matt's bad driving in a minute. But why don't yeah. we talk about Diggerland first? What the F is Diggerland? Right, what is it? Right. What can is I it? You... Well, can I tell you how it started? Yeah, but if it's boring, I'm going to shout at you. No, I want no, no. Go on then, no. tell decide, us about it. We decided to have a bar. Boring. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Hear me out. Go we on. decided to have a barbecue one, e one evening. Uh, do you know what plant hire is? What plant hire? Yeah, of course yeah. you do. That's where you get a plant. You just hire it because you can't look after it for its whole life. So you just bring it in the house, have it there for about an hour, let your dog yeah, weird no, it, I give knew, it back. I knew you'd say that. Right? No, you didn't. Do you, what you were setting me up? Who are you, the Sean Wright Phillips of Radio or something? We we hired diggers out. Yeah, you hired diggers out. Yeah, we had a barbecue one evening and yeah. invited all the residents round for a bit of a laugh. <laughs> what and, residents? Residents and, of what? The well, home. just all our friends. Are you in a loony family. bin? <laughs> all our friends and family round. We invited them round to our yard, and we saw these kids, families, mums, dads playing on diggers, and they were having great, great fun. What do you mean we you thought, were letting hey, people ride diggers? Yeah, why not? Because it's irresponsible, because they could die. No, 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 it's all very, very safe. It's How very, is it safe, safe, Mick? How is it safe being in charge of a digger? <laughs> How is it let not... Me, let, me, let, 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 let me finish. Can would I you, finish? Would you let a child your... ride Knight Rider? Would you let a child <laughs> ride Knight Rider, would you, Mick? In Knight hey, Rider land? We let them sit on diggers, mm -hmm. and we saw they were having so much fun, and we thought, hey... That better not be a euphemism, idea. Mick. That better not be a euphemism. 
go on. <laughs> all right, all right. I knew I'd struggle here. Um, no, we saw them playing on machines and having a bit of fun. We thought, wouldn't it be a great idea to open an adventure park where people can come along and just have a drive and ride and have a go on diggers? And Very that's dangerous. <laughs> it's not dangerous. <laughs> I've got a new land. It's called Glue Sniffing Land. We noticed <laughs> that the teenagers were enjoying <laughs> sniffing glue. Chainsaw <laughs> Land. <laughs> where all no, your dreams no. come true. Oh, great. Have you been, then? White been? supremacist ideology land. <laughs> no, we ain't been. Where is Diggerland? Well, we've, we've got four in the UK. Four Diggerlands? What? But hey? How big are they? What, what, each of them? Yeah, each of them. How big's the biggest one and where well, is we got, it? We've got about 100 machines there. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's if... about 100 machines. About, <laughs> uh, I don't know, 50, 60 acre sites. Oi, Diggerland Mick, if yeah. me and Matt turn up there and G and that, can we have a go yeah. and dig? Can we drive diggers around? Yeah, 12 and a half quid a head. Right, That's hey, all right. Matt. Are you allowed to dig? <laughs> Can we dig something up? You'd love it. You'd absolutely love it. Well, are you not worried, Mick, that people might think just sort of House of Horror style place called Diggerland, where you just sort of have to go underneath a patio and have a sort of a grisly treasure trove? Yeah, we're getting very pretty and correct here, right? No, no, not at all. No, you, you Mick, don't you sense uh, well, Mick from Diggerland's going, we've been a bit politically incorrect there. <laughs> Rail it in, lads. <laughs> Don't uh, believe yeah. the hype. <laughs> I, I knew, as I said before, I knew this would be hard, hard work. I remember seeing you on Blue Peter. Can you remember that? No, because I've never been in it. What are you talking about? <laughs> you talking to me. I was a presenter on Blue Peter for a while. <laughs> what were you, one of the pets? Put Matt in a little cardboard box for the winter months, but leave plenty of air holes in there so that he can get his cowboy gear <laughs> Hello, in. No, I'm not ready yet. I've got so much to give. <laughs> Put him in there in June, because he's a pain in the arse, frankly. <laughs> Stick him in there. What, what are you talking about, Blue Peter? Who do you think... Well, do you think I'm I someone do... else? you think I'm Andy Peters or something? Ah, uh, right, right. No, no bother at all. Um, are you going to come along and see us, then? We yes. will come, but only if we're allowed to do things for free and things that would not usually be deemed safe or moral in Digger. Well, I want to knock down a wall. Here's a, here's a challenge for you. Go on. What's um, the challenge? Did you, did you used to have a push bike? Yeah. Could you wheelie it? No. No. no? Well, I could get you to wheelie a JCB. You sexy pig. Yeah. How many man. people have died at Diggerland? Hey, uh, no, no one, no one. No Is one, Diggerland? No one. Are the diggers <laughs> no at Diggerland mostly used for digging mass yeah. graves for all your <laughs> dead clients? <laughs> <laughs> Diggerland, hey, just, just come for the one, fun, stay for the burial. Diggerland. Just remember one thing. Go on. Well, that's going to ruin me diggers. life if I just remember one yeah. thing. What if it's not relevant information? His, uh, autobiography would be rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, there was a sort of a tunnel of darkness, then I saw a bit of my mum, and then that's it, pretty much. Go on, what's the one thing, Mick? Bigger diggers dig deeper. Bigger diggers dig deeper. You've got to remember that. The bigger the one. digger, the deeper yeah. you dig. So are you going to come along and have a, a go wheelie in these JCBs? Uh, you and your mate there. What's your mate's name? <laughs> Pauline. This is Auntie Pauline. Pauline. Me and Auntie Pauline will be along there. We're going to drive them JCBs with no knickers on, and I'm going to squirt <laughs> musk all over the seats. <laughs> so the very next person who comes in your JCB is going to get an hell of a surprise. <laughs> Mick, you've been a hell of a treat. Talking to you has reminded me that the idea of religion is quite simply bonkers. <laughs> is this really going out on bloody radio? Yeah, no, listen to no, it. No, Don't no. be stupid. This is a project. This is a hospital radio. Radio. We're, we're yeah. talking to you live from Maudsley Mental Institution, London Town. This yeah. is just our project. This, they just do this to keep our spirits up. Mick, you, thank you, you very much. You guys have got the right idea. Thank Good you, baby. You. Talk to you later. Cheers. There Cheers. goes old Mick from Diggerland. That is not a safe land. Just because kids find something fun, don't mean that you should build a yeah. land. And why, what was going on at a barbecue where people so <laughs> went, let's have a go on them diggers? Yeah, what kind of... Barbecue right. is that? I've been to barbecues and never has it ended up with can I have a go on your digger, has it? It's no. not part of the barbecue way. But what I'd like to have a go at go on. is when they knock down a wall with one of those things, like a wrecking ball. Oh, do you think they can have that? And no. what, what I'm wall saying, they I'd like to have a go. If there was a wrecking ball land, I'd go there. Well, I think it wouldn't be safe. Well, none of it's safe. <laughs> That's true. It's a lunatic. Once you disregard the idea of safety, theme parks become a lot more fun, don't yeah. they? Senseless murder of prostitutes, lad. Chopping people's heads off, lad. Sex with animals, lad. It's just bonkers. Once mm. he... Mick is a pioneer in many ways, I think. I think Mick should start more lands. I don't think he's telling the truth, because how's there four of them? How have we not heard of Diggerland? Exactly. There's four of them. Yeah. <laughs> you they're called Diggerland, Digger World. Yeah. Digger principality. Yeah, well, like the, yeah. Euro digger. 
<laughs> He's a liar. There's no such thing. Right, Mick, we've dismissed his words as the babbling of a loony. Why don't we listen to the Libertines Can't Stand Me Now, Can't Stand Me Now. Then afterwards we'll hear some anecdotes about Matt Morgan's dangerous driving. Listen to Russell Brown on Radio 2. You're listening to Russell Brand on BBC Radio 2. That was the Libertines Can't Stand Me Now. Difficult not to feel moved by the tension in the relationship between Carl and Peter towards the end of their relationship. How wonderful to see that they're beginning to work together again. Earlier in the show, we did play Daniel Johnston. Matt just mentioned that I should probably say that Daniel Johnston is an unusual man and was mentally ill for most of his life, so sometimes <laughs> his recordings do suffer. So, you know, bear with him if That's they sound a bit scratchy and low quality. It's because he's been <laughs> made by someone who's mentally ill. But he's still alive, and I'd like to get him on our show one day, he's Matt. He's brilliant. He's a very brilliant man, isn't he? I'd mm-hmm. like to get him on. But I quite, what I quite like about him is he's, like, he's an artist, and they, there's none of that, you know, sort of like the artifice of the um, the artist is mentally ill and a bit wild, ooh, you know, but like he's proper really is. balmy. Yeah, it's not like, oh, God, he's crazy, he drank a goldfish. It's like, no, he might kill himself, for God's sake. I'm going to go and get him. Right, OK, what did I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, it was You're Matt slagging Morgan. slagging off my driveway. Yeah, I was slagging it off quite rightly, because we have a day, Matt. We, we're we in this bottle green pickup truck going across the USA, truck, truck, trucking across the USA, right? And um, the other day, we pulled out somewhere, I don't know where we was, Kansas, Ville, somewhere like that. Pulled out of this place. We'd been by some bridge on the Mississippi. I think that's Route where it 66. was. We'd been on Route Bloody 66. We walked up on a disused bridge. Beautiful it was. Made of cast iron. And we looked out over the Mississippi. Great big vast thing, isn't it? Snaking its way through the country. Dirty python. Makes the Thames sort of look like well, looks like the t- it makes the Thames look like a, an image on a bottle of Evian, doesn't it? Looks it? like a lovely little stream. I've, yeah, it does compared to that. The Mississippi crawls like a slug through America, right? We had a little look there. We met a couple of blind gents walking along. Interesting meeting that couple of blind gents, wasn't it? Yeah. The thing is, with a blind gent, you don't know how when to Just shake, shake the hand. Them. Difficult. I, know. I was stuck with my hand out, and then you think, oh no, he doesn't know I've got my hand out. But what you should never have done, Matt, and which I'm ashamed of to this day, is that you cupped his genitals in that. Way. Well, um, I don't know. I just think it put everyone at their ease. <laughs> In many ways. And the that... fact that he jumped into the Mississippi. <laughs> that's probably just to unwind. I after... think, you know, he just he lives downstream and he fancies. It's a quick way of getting home. I don't want to live no more. First Lord, you take my sight, now you're taking my dignity. Goodbye, crew world. Right. That's the sound of him landing in the Mississippi. We just done there. Then, right, we went off and, like, we drove for about a mile and then some, what I can only describe as an <laughs> hillbilly, sort of screeched up beside us as we're roaring the down the freeway. Yeah, freeway, is that called in America? Highway, freeway. Highway, freeway. Highway, your no way. way, your way. We all scream for ice cream. Went past us, this hillbilly went, Your truck's kicking out a lot of smoke there, buddy. Or something like that, <laughs> didn't he? To Matt. And Matt <laughs> tried to communicate with him. What's that, mate? You are a gaff? <laughs> Ridiculous conversation. Yeah, hell of a lot of smoke there. It's like hearing Uncle Jesse out of the Dukes of Acid talking to old man Steptoe. <laughs> <laughs> baffling conversation. Going along at 90 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. And then um, we realised that the problem was our, our, our truck was kicking out a lot of smoke. And the reason was Matt was driving along, all confident with his arm out the bloody window, like <laughs> all <laughs> like, cocky, tapping the roof of the truck, like spitting out the window once in a while, nodding his head to his music, driving on the handbrake on. We drove around about four miles yeah, an handbrake on. Yeah, it's like on. in a normal car. It's operated from your foot, right? And I wish we'd, we'd had a better chance be of them two blokes, on. one with legs, one without legs. I'd rather have legs than without legs driving right, a car. Right, can I just say, Go on. I've driven, right, yeah. and once I drove for about seven hours straight, yeah. And then, uh, like, eight hours straight. Oh, what have you, How long have you driven? I can't drive! Why not? God, I was drunk always and on drugs when I was a little boy, so I couldn't learn So to. you just sit there. You're, like, Russell is in charge of... What are you in charge of? Air conditioning. Uh, yep. And iPod. Yep. Always nice and cool in that car. Always. No, it's not. <laughs> it fluctuates between... <laughs> Overly hot and overly cold. It's like monsoon, isn't it, in that car? One minute it's too hot, one minute it's too cold. It's like Goldilocks' porridge in our car. Stupid. And then he he falls asleep with his mouth open. (laughs) 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 I love you. Don't touch my balls. (laughs) (laughs) Muttering all sorts of things. So what if I mutter sex obscenities when I sleep? A guy's got rights. A guy's got rights. I'm awake. I'm on it. I'm driving across America. He's asleep next to me. Then he wakes up and goes, Who? 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 On. <laughs> what about when you had to pull over on the old shoulder and it was a bit where sort of like the road dovetailed, people were joining the freeway on one yeah, side. Yeah, it's the most dangerous the... place to stop. You should have seen him flapping like no, a fish No, because you one. shouldn't stop there. <laughs> drive the car! Drive the car! 
<laughs> no. <laughs> oh, as if I'd ask you to drive it. I was saying, look down the lane where people are coming onto the motorway to make sure no one's coming while I look on this side. And Russell's going, no, no, I'll look that way. No, let's stay here. Let's start a new life here. And it's the most dangerous place to stop. He was going, just, I think we should just be relaxed and just, hey, let's, like let's talk Sally. about this. You were like, Aunt Sally trying because to Because we're stopped in the most dangerous place. From a chimney sweep. Oh, get your filthy balls off my I should have kicked drawers. you out. We're going to be killed in the motorway. It was like the animal mob. We're going to be killed. You don't understand the road. Yeah, you don't just, understand where it's I safe. I am the road. I live the road. No, you don't. You I see an air-conditioned comfort <laughs> going through your iPod, building so playlists. Home, I'm showing my boobs to the world, and I want you to know that, listeners of this show, Stroke Podcast, I'm doing it as a protest. Not just for me, but for all the oppressed people in the world, yeah? For all the people who know what it's like well, maybe to I'll be show my bad. Boobs. Show your boobs, baby. Oh, my God, they're coming out. Oh, my sweet Jesus. I've never seen anything like it. You're in a gorgeous shape, Matthew. I know. What a valley. I'm I thought off. the Grand Canyon was an impressive natural sight till I saw Matthew's knockers. It's incredible what's going on. It's like, this, it's like when it goes into the break on Incredible Hulk. <laughs> I will like you when you're angry with your big green boobs, your sex objects, and your perfectly torn trousers, dirty devil. Now, my driving is good. It's got us across America. You're... Without mishap. Mishap, driving along the van, brakes, shouting out the window like a maiden spinster arm. One on. thing. It's one like thing. Driven about by a character out of, like, something out of the mind of Philip Larkin. Oh, we're going to bring her to Hoover Hoopers, Hoopers. My driving is better than your social skills, How Andrea. dare you? What about what when every, wrong? every... Right, this has happened about four times. <laughs> Hotel receptionists, <laughs> shop girls. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm famous in England. <laughs> oh, oh, I've got a website. <laughs> oh, have you got the internet here? Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's russellbrand.com. Have a look. There I am. That's me. I'm famous in England. Did I mention that? Um, will you um, you'd like to go for tea with me? I'm ever so English and unthreatening. That's what I've had to put up with. I'm a little bit like J.R. Hartley. Going on. Oh, it's J.R. Russellbrand.com. Look at it. Russellbrand.com. And we were in one shop and the woman wrote his name wrong. Mm. And it's, he still came up on Google Images. And he goes, see, that's how famous I am. He got my name wrong and I still came up. <laughs> yeah. He put in Russell Grant and I still came up. In your face, Russell Grant, in your astrology, in your camp. If you type Russell Grant in a Google, do you know what you get? Russell Brand. That's what you get. And then he says to him, I'll be famous here soon as well. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll take over your country. <laughs> see you later. <laughs> Click, clack off in the Avon lady boots. <laughs> Baby, we're not made for Avon. I'm a pretty wild, a rock and roll rebel. I'm a pirate of the modern age. I reckon you do Avon parties where you take off your boots, <laughs> open them up, and there's all stuff in there, all products. Now, look, in my left boot, they've got moisturisers and tinted stuff. If got you lip salve. Look into the hill, we've got facial wipes in there. You could just look at you girls. You could be fiddles, fiddles in no time at all. It's party plan. You can pay over a number of months. Ding dong, Avon lady. <laughs> People don't have Avon ladies no more. They've been wiped know. off the face of the planet. Maybe people don't know what we're talking about. Avon ladies used to come around your house when you was a kid to try to sell like your mum's stuff. <laughs> they were not dressed like me. Don't conjure up the image of well, these look at you. gothic and also, beauties. He's been wearing this necklace with a little skull dangling So? On it. You look about 12. <laughs> <laughs> that skull is cool. People like that skull, mate. That's, I'll tell you something. When, I, when this kicks like off Halloween America, thing. they'll probably make me their leader over here, I would have thought, once that film comes out. <laughs> yeah, once the film comes out, oh, yeah, the things film. will be all the nice film. and different. Oh, we've got to have rabbits there. <laughs> and how fell the plants when the film comes <laughs> out? It is a little bit like uh, George and Lenny from Mice and Men. Lenny constantly needs to be reassured by Steinbeck's character, George. I mean, they're both Steinbeck characters. He didn't write it with someone else and insert a character. Constantly goes, oh, in the future. Well, be, can you tell us about the future again? And he goes, oh, yeah, all right, in the future there'll be alfalfa plants. We'll have rabbits. What colour will the rabbits be? In the end, it gets more and more ridiculous because they're constantly nervous because they live a peripatetic, wandering, vagabond lifestyle. Not unlike a couple of other guys out on the highway of America. One, a nervous spinster driving a car like Aunt Sally. The other, a striking man, noble like a Michelangelo statue, chiselled from by God's own hand. Yep, 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 yep. What should we listen to, Matthew? It's, just like, it's like I'm driving a tit around. <laughs> That's why I'm a tit delivery man. <laughs> Hello, what's the, what town are we in today? Well, here's your tit. <laughs> Hello, town. I'm famous in England. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, better than that, the Norwegian hypochondriac covering up his skin. Oh, my makeup! I don't know if it's makeup. Yeah, but I'm on camera. Be the Avon lady when you're the only one wearing makeup. Good I'm not wearing it now, Avon lady. Otherwise, you wouldn't have no makeup. You to used yourself. my makeup one day. Then I realised I might as well be like a mate. Mate, it's like being Danny. Hey, 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 hey. You're like Danny LaRue in a cowboy hat. That's what you are, no, mate. No, I'm not. I look masculine. <laughs> masculine compared to who? For Christ's sake! <laughs> but if you, you look, it's disgusting. Shut <laughs> up. Look listen, at you. listen, listen. Hang on, we you. never even told the story of going uh, to the gym dressed as each other. Oh yeah, we ended up going. This match had to double gym clothes, so I had to go in Matt's clothes. We we're both wearing sort of cut-off combat trousers. Converse boots, other boots are available. Black vests and had our hair tied up in a top knot bun. We walked down the street, we looked like Milly Vanilli, didn't we? We, we looked just stupid. Absolute couple of twerks. Russell looks extremely tall. Like, it's for some reason, when you wear civilian clothing, you look mm. like freakishly tall. Because I you? suppose, what I wanted to be, Matthew, is when I'm wearing my normal clothes, the charisma is so powerful, you scarcely notice any of the other physical qualities. But when I've made. The oversized head. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you! I've got a perfect skull. It needs it needs to be big, it's all stuffed with brains and knowledge and intelligence and ego. Now come on, and then we see it. We That's why our petrol bill's so high in this <laughs> truck. <laughs> Cutting your massive head around the States. Yeah, it's probably because you're driving with the handbrake on. That's what's putting the bill up. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> so it should do. You're a disgrace to the road. You're a disgrace to the memory of Jack Kelly. Take that back. <laughs> what? Well, I'm going to drive him to the Central Reservation. Good, <laughs> Good. the Red Indians will recognise me as a spiritual man. They'll probably give me a name. They'll probably call me Walks Like you Avon idiot. Lady. The Central You're... Reservation is a part of a motorway that separates the lanes, <laughs> not somewhere where Red Indians live. Ah, they're not called Red Indians! Racist! Hate crime! Hate crime! <laughs> Go on the track! Hate crime! Ashes to ashes, they Native bang. Americans. Russell Brand, hate crime! Native Americans. Right, right, get to. Ashes to Ashes, that's David Bowie. During that track, you should know, listeners, <laughs> the first thing that happened when that track went out was Matt goes, I'm a good driver. But I mean, when we were doing oh, it, yeah. he was when we were doing it, he goes, oh, that really hurt. But as soon as the track goes, I'm a good driver, that's go, you are a good driver, mate. I, I didn't mean none of those things. It's all right. If I wasn't a good driver, we wouldn't be here in one piece. What do you mean? What are the options then? Mindless spinster-like caution or death? Is that, is that what we've got a jitter between, is I'd it? I'd love, well, I wouldn't love to see. I'd hate to see you <laughs> driving. I'd be brilliant in the old jalopy. Bob, Bob, get out of the way! Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! I could be like Mr Toad, it'll be ace. We'd have yeah, all... that's exactly what you would be like. <laughs> You'd last about a day. Why? Why are you being so pessimistic about my driving, which I believe would be brilliant? Right, you're listening to Russell Brand on Radio 2 and 88 to 91 FM. Sorry you can't email us or text us. That is because we are pre-recorded in Boulder, Colorado. What a place it is. What a show we're making here. What a wonderful, giddy world of experience we have been having through the mind and works of Jack Paddywhack. What are you looking at, Matt? All confused. I've seen my reflection in the, in the window and I think I look pretty cool. Pretty cool if what you want to look like is a penny for the guy from Mulder here, do you? Penny for the guy! Penny for Oh, the guy! That's that going to be <laughs> Lemmy. <laughs> yeah, that's... Lord to Campbell! <laughs> I'm about to take in you! Yeah, hold on, let's see what else is going on. In the wonderful world of Colorado, with a little glance at the Colorado Daily News. Licker loonies. CU warns football fans to forget smuggling booze on Saturday night. Then it doesn't say anything else about it. What's happening? And it just says nothing else. It's a very unusual... You're really good at this newspaper. <laughs> hold Link. on, hold on. Here we go. You booze, you lose. When it comes to creative ways to sneak alcohol into football games, CU Police <laughs> Commander Brad Weasley has seen just about everything. Well, I know Brad what I do. Brad Weasley? <laughs> I'll tell you who to put in charge of the police force. A man with the word weasel somewhere in his name. As an adjective, though. Weasley. No, that's an adverb. Yeah. He says, the camelbacks were worn underneath shirts. And what's this? A long time ago, it says Weasley, as if we can trust him, when camelbacks first came out, and I'd never what seen them. camelbacks? A... I don't know, but I'm guessing a camel is an animal what stores water in its hump. That's a myth. It's no, it ain't. Oh, yeah, but you get the, the fat, it's not, you know, it's getting water out of that fat, and it? He's hydrating himself. You fool. He doesn't have to drink water because he's got all that fat. That's why. What, you drink, you think a camel's crossing the desert drinking fat? He's drinking out fat. Out of his own back. <laughs> he pops yeah, a straw yeah. into his back, and he sucks up the fat. Okay, okay, and that's why you're allowed to lick the cake bowl when your mother does a cake, because it's good for you. 
I'd seen camelbacks before, but I'd never heard of one. I saw about six or eight persons, not people, trying to sneak alcohol in that way. Weasley said, the camelbacks were worn under shirts, filled with beverage of choice. You wouldn't have a beverage that you've smuggled in in your camelback that you didn't even want. What's the point of having a camelback if you're just going to well, fill it with tadpole mule, juice? You might be a mule for someone else. That's true, you could be a mule. Yeah, but that's what kind of job's that? Smuggling booze into a football game for other people. I, uh, there's much better ways, surely. I'd put it into a canister, a cylindrical calendar, just pop it in the old bottom. Then uh, pull it right out. Well, you're not going to get drunk on that unless you've got <laughs> some sort of cathedral up there. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I like to go there to worship. I'll be honest, it is a place of religious significance. Also, why be a mule at all, smuggling drugs around the world? Uh, Booze. Yeah, but say that you're... No, but if you're a mule, like, you know, them ones in, from Colombia or whatever... You get a lot of money for it if it goes right. Don't, if it goes don't wrong, advertise it. It ain't a good job. It ain't a career choice. I'm just saying that's why they do it. They have to swallow a condom all full of drugs. What kind of way is that to spend an evening? Swallowing a condom full of drugs. A terrible career choice. Noel Gallagher will not be on this show because he's busy at the moment with his bird having some sort of baby. Now, a lot of people would take that as a sign of a lack of commitment from Noel Gallagher. I'm one such person. From now on, Noel Gallagher will be known as El Bastardo. <laughs> and only mentioned in those terms. El Bastardo will be back next week talking about a baby or something. I don't know, has the baby been born, do you think? I don't know. Because mm, you're here with me. Yes. So how would you know? That's a good point. Yeah, I'm just saying I wouldn't like to be a mule, is all. I wouldn't uh, want to be a drug smuggler. How would smuggler. you smuggle booze into a football game if you needed to? In my cheeks. Just smuggle it in there, right in the cheeks. That's ridiculous. I suppose, then just get drunk before you go. Just go in there blind drunk enough to last you for the whole game. That's not a bad idea. You're just drunk anyway, then spend the whole time just trying to get your head back together enough to appreciate where you are and what's going on. You could soak wet wipes in vodka. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. You could have little capsules of booze, like blood capsules, that when you're pretending to be Dracula, stored again in your cheeks. All my methods are mostly about internal body orifices, but when I was you a smuggler... You need more booze than that. Take drugs then, because you can get a very big high off a smaller amount. That's my advice, Chair, if you are in the Colorado area and you want to do some smuggling. But if... It might be a slight legal problem with that, <laughs> you might have to now apologise for. Don't smuggle or take drugs, you silly idiots. What about our homeless chums? We just met a load of homeless chums hanging out in Denver. Right, I thought, that would be nice to talk to them, didn't I, Matt? Didn't I? Because yeah. you know me, I'm a friend of the common man, not some sort of tottering Avon lady, as some people would portray me. More of a, I don't know, I mean, the word Jesus has come up quite a lot in conversation these days with a mirror that I like to look at in the evening, wearing my crown of thorns, shouting, you're Jesus, at... And we went up to them homeless people, all nice as pie-like, and started chatting to them. Lovely, weren't they, the homeless? They Three or four really of them lovely. in wheelchairs. Yeah. Broken wheelchairs. One bloke, broken wrist, broken ankle, another bloke, a leg made out of... Well, what did that look like? It looked like a sort of a metal banister, didn't it? It was a false leg. Ah, oh, <laughs> I mean, I was wondering. I thought, my God, he's some sort of robot What's fellow. the future? Uh, what happens in the future? Am I as famous in America? Can you get a boat on the end of that? <laughs> oh, it's not. In the future, will my film be a success? Then whenever I go in the shop, I don't have to use the internet, but I can just have sex in the traditional fashion. I'm surprised you didn't print out a Wikipedia article on yourself. <laughs> Hello, guys. Hi. I'm famous in England. Now, sorry to see you're so homeless. Now, here's the Wikipedia page on me, Russell Brand. Whether it's Dance Floor Chart or the Radio 2 podcast, Russell Brand is a roaring <laughs> laugh to be around. Just read that while I nod sympathetically. Wake up, please. Wake up. You're passing out. No, no don't gouch out. Don't gouch out. No, stay with it. Stay with it. Come on. Like, them homeless, they was nice boat and birds. But uh, what I liked most was that old black lady, again, with a bit of the old peg toothery, right? I like the way that she got all passionate. She'd go, oh, my God. She'd talk to her and go, oh, what's it like being homeless? It's a bit horrible, is it? And she goes, yeah, well, you know, but we got each other. We've got each other, but, man, what's wrong with people today? And then she'd sort of start crying, wouldn't she? Yeah. After, after a while, I goes, yeah, I don't get so passionate because it makes you cry. But she was all right about it, wasn't she? She had a good laugh. She was lovely. Then... Right, when we got back into our vehicle, this bloke who looks a bit like, say you're, in a, uh, you're watching a film and a cop comes over with mirrored sunglasses and leans in the window, he's all stout with his head like a brush of hair, thick, coarse brush hair. Imagine John Goodman, but evil, right? He came over, right, sort of leaned in the window, sort of craned and goes, uh, what was his main thrust of his argument? This is my corner. Look, you haven't helped them, you've made them take drugs. Well, I think they needed the drugs anyway. They're living in the bloody streets. That's not... 
you know, what are and you going to do? And he was racist to us. He goes, go back to England. He said, go back to England. So I will go back to England where people are a bit less racist, you great big fuck. But having said that, he's the only horrible person I've met in America. So the sort of stereotype of the American lout, the idea of the embodiment as, of America as like sort of a policeman of the world going around nosing things up. That ain't of the, the common people of America. Lovely bunch, friendly, friendly. warm. It's the government. That's the problem, isn't it? The American government. And while we're on the subject of government, China, if you're still in Tibet, get out of Tibet! Get right out of Tibet! What are you doing in Tibet? I've told you a hundred times, Tibet is not for you, it's for the Tibetians! They love it there! Uh, yeah, so, uh, that bloke craned in right through our bloody window, didn't he? All breathing on us. Right. Hit our car. Hit the car! Our truck. I wish you'd done some of your craft Maga on him. I should have. You should have got his balls, and I could have used my, I could have used my Avon lady boots to crunch his skull in. That would have been wrong, of course. I'm not advocating <laughs> violence. Sandra. <laughs> well, I'm Sandra Proudfoot. You cross Sandra Proudfoot, you better get ready to have your skull stove in, baby. Yeah, because then, um, all right, fair enough. I appreciate his liberal position of, uh, not liberal, a liberal, of like, don't, don't, you know, drugs are bad. Of course drugs are bad. Of course you shouldn't take drugs. But if you're homeless and you ain't got no legs, what are you going to do, for God's sake? You're entitled to be a bit cheered up, I would have thought. Well, now, no, the key point as well is, mm, if you gave them money, yeah. then... And they are human beings with rights. Yeah, it's up to them. What they're, they do with their money. They're is free up to, to them. take drugs. What's he, the policeman of the world? He goes, that's my corner. Yeah. They're equal to him. He, he, what, and also, Don't give them anything. It's better they've got nothing. Much more better to have nothing at all and no freedom and no rights. Also, he wasn't coming from a perspective of, I want to protect those homeless people. He's coming from the perspective of, I'm in a position of power. Yeah. Don't meddle with my power. If he'd been authentic, of course, drugs don't help homeless people. He would have said, hey, guys, that was really nice, but let me no. tell you the other side yeah. of the story. But he didn't. He came over and goes, This is my corner. Those are my tramps. I've been, <laughs> I've been running these tramps since 1966. And look I'm at I'm damn proud of those tramps. There's not a tramp there that I wouldn't make love to if I was lonely and bored enough. And you giving those tramps money gives them a little bit of independence. And that means I'm going to find it harder to force them to flake me on the corners that I own. He was a disgusting example of a human being, that man, weren't he, Matthew? Yes, he was. That's why we, and we drove him. off with our handbrake on. Yeah, we drove smoked off. Smoked in his face. <laughs> Me with my cowboy boots rooting tooting on the dashboard. Matt nervously flicking glances over his shoulders, hitching up his petticoats. We hightailed out there, and then I weed against a wall in the street. Atavistically, I suppose now to represent the idea of I'll do what I no, like. Just because you're disgusting, you wee anyway. Like when we're going <laughs> along in our lovely truck, and you wee in a bottle, <laughs> and then you empty it out the window. It turns to vapor. Don't worry, it's only t it's turns to vapor. <laughs> I don't care, it's going all over the truck. It's only vapor. You smell it in the car. The whole air's full of vapor. You're the one the other day who goes, every breath you take, you get a molecule of Hitler in it. And that made me think, you must get other people as well, not just Hitler. And that made me think, that's nice. Every breath, a big cocktail of death. Delicious. Delicious. Full of Hitlery goodness. I mean, I don't want to drink so much Hitler breath that I turn into some sort of Hitlerian. But if every Hitler breath's got a bit of Gandhi, a bit of Martin Luther King, a bit of Che Guevara, you're scarcely going to notice the Hitler. You could probably have an extra swig. It just means you'll have a nice uniform and some lovely values. Now, Not imagine, like that pig in the street. Be in a car with this man <laughs> for hours on end, driving across America. <laughs> He goes from manic to asleep. <laughs> hey, Matthew, wouldn't it be really good if we could make a castle or made out of ice cream? Then we could Don't just touch the wheel. <laughs> Don't touch the wheel, please. <laughs> I went to sleep. The air conditioning's gone wrong. Hey, Matthew, what if we was flies? We could go... <laughs> I'm good at weeing in cars, so I did it on tour. Hey, when I'm on my tour, I wee in a bottle every single day. We line up jars of stuff. I give it to the roadies, then we auction it at the gig. Bottle of wee wee, I say. Every penny goes to charity. I say charity. I mean me. Not really. No one sells wee wee for money. Not in the modern world. It'd never work. What have we got coming up? Paint it black. Yes. Paint any colour you want. Don't be so restrictive, man. Paint it red. Paint it yellow. Why does he want to paint everything black for? Because he's depressed, if you listen to the lyrics. Well, cheer up, mate. You're in the Rolling Stones. Yeah, you're telling me your life. You've got lovely hair. Your whole life's ahead of you. Don't... You're a good kid. I'll stick up for you in the staff room. All the other teachers, Mick, they say you're a silly little bugger. He went to my school, so he had he the went... same staff room as me. Of course he had the same staff room as you. I stuck up for you in there. You was good you kids. You didn't. You were snooping around it, cleaning it up for the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> And he clean and he turn in the stuff. <laughs> yeah, for a sixpence I'll buff your shoes, said Master. That's how you end up alcoholic, because you're always cleaning the stuff and having a nip of whiskey. <laughs> oh, well, just another nip. Keep me going. Nip, nip. You get me through the hoovering. <laughs> hey, good marking, guys. <laughs> Keep it up. Hey, I love that pie tart stuff you told us earlier was brilliant. I'll just have another swig. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Let's listen to Pony Black. 
paint it black, the Rolling Stones. I say, you red don't want to paint it black. Even if it's black, I'll still do just another coat of black just to be sure that no wood seeps through, you know. Sometimes you use Ron Seal varnish when there's nothing else available. Strange concept for a song. That's, of course, the Rolling Stones. This show is nearly over, and what a show it's been from Boulder, Colorado. I'd like to thank Matt Morgan for insulting me. Now, if you are in San Francisco or somewhere near enough to San Francisco that you could get there, check this out for a bit of brain info. We are doing a gig on Wednesday the 19th of September, is that right? Yes. Wednesday the 19th of September, we are going to do this gig at the Beat Museum, 540 Broadway at Columbus, San Francisco, 94133. Contact Jerry Chimino. Second camera, Randall Love. <laughs> Contact Pete <laughs> as well. Oh, sorry. Rand, don't, no one attack Randall Love. Right, so... 7pm. Uh, Wednesday 7 p.m. Wednesday the 19th, San Francisco Beat Museum, 540 Broadway at Columbus. <laughs> come there. If you're our American fans, come there and make me feel famous. I can't go to that gig with a laptop going, Hello, <laughs> I know I'm just doing a small gig now, but I have done gigs at Wembley Stadium for Live Earth. Oh, I remember Chris Rock said to me, Well, just nothing Get really. out of my way. That's it, yes. Get out of my way, he said. You're, what was it, ru ruining the show with your amateurish bungling. <laughs> Chris and I, we just have a rapport, very natural, between... Chris and I. So come to that big gig, Beat Museum, 540 Broadway, Columbus, San Francisco. Let's tell them the telephone, because what could go wrong? 415-509-2149. Ring them up and book it. Not if you're in England and you're not going, bothering them and pestering them. Be sensible. Grow up. Put your willy away. That's not for a game. Right, OK, be what better way to end a radio show than with a poem done by Poet Laureate of the show, Mr G. Mr G, we listened to one of your CDs in the car the other day. Matthew didn't like it, of course. He <laughs> prefers to listen to classical music. I liked it. No, he loved it, actually. We all um, had a lovely time. It made us go a bit misty-eyed at the memory of We go between G and, Mi and Alan Bennett. <laughs> we do listen to Alan Bennett in the car. Mother, of course, continues to deteriorate. Yeah, we're, 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 we're going to be doing a collaboration. Yeah, it's difficult to distinguish between the two of you now, to tell you the truth. We don't know where Alan Bennett ends and you begin, which is, a, you know, a good suggestion that your relationship's going well. So, hey, listen, G, uh, let's summarise the show. Mr G, England's finest poet, the Jack Kerouac of our generation, <laughs> by bloody goddery, is Mr G, create atmosphere. Me and <laughs> yeah, look at Matt hunching his shoulders up so he can clap. <laughs> OK, this poem's well, called The Open Road. On the open road amidst empty spaces far reaching and wide, facing mile after mile after mile after mile. Time has been reduced to endless lights and street signs. Cowboy town to the right, Sesame Street to the left, where Snuffleupagus gets a rush from the dust from an etcher sketch. Let's play spot the tourist at the door of the club, with cowboy hats and skull boots giving a snuggle tooth love. Bigger diggers Oi. dig deeper. Mick's got a fleet that he'll allow Russell to drive, stand by the Grim Reaper. On the open road, tarmac's <laughs> dusty and gritty, passing city after city after the city after city, a hillbilly sights blinded by the belt of delights. There's no stopping this tit delivery unless the handbrake's applied. <laughs> Woo, Mr. G! There best he ever. goes! All on the mic, he continues to get better. How can he continue to pry? He improves and improves his new heights every show. It's two o'clock in the morning. Well done. <laughs> it's two o'clock in the morning in London, is it? Yeah. Ha ha, you silly fools, we're in the middle of daytime. Me and Matt are doing this show completely naked. Thank you, everyone that's been involved in our show. Thank you, Digger Man. Thank you. Who was that other bloke we talked to? Snuffle Waffle Gus. Yes. Thanks, Snuffle Waffle Gus. Noel Gallagher, you've betrayed us. El Bastardo, as you are now known. Hope that baby's born okay. Hope Sarah's everything's okay in the world of Noel Gallagher. Thank you for listening to our show. Download our podcast. If you're in San Francisco or it's in Byron, get to that gig and make me feel special, for God's sake. And Matt, too, you know, the two of us. We're very much two mm. hearts living with just one mind. Do come along and look at Russell's boots. These it boots! It promises to be an entertaining evening. How dare you? How dare you? I, they're like Billy's boots. I'm magic in these boots. Listen to me dance. That's me dancing, baby. Thanks for listening to the show. 88 to 91 FM. This is Radio 2 from the BBC. Bye. Bye.